Uh, good afternoon. My name is Julian Goldman, and I'm, I am here for a moment only uh, to introduce uh, my friend and mentor, John Glasser, who is going to um, deliver the lecture that you've all been waiting for and that I've been waiting for. He's going to be using his crystal ball to tell us about the impact of information technology on healthcare delivery. And John doesn't need much of a crystal ball because his career and a lot of the work that he's done has actually shaped uh, the future that we're, we are going to experience. And uh, his career has been uh, a very interesting career and his work now I think is, uh, this new phase of his life is probably equally interesting from what I've been hearing over lunch. So let me tell you a little bit about John. Uh, he's the CEO of the Health Services Business Unit of Siemens Healthcare and uh, where he oversees the global health information technology business of somewhere around 7,000 employees. Um, prior to joining Siemens, Dr. Glasser worked at Partners Healthcare uh, for Partners Corporate and prior to that for the Brigham and Women's Hospital for only 22 years. And uh, many of you uh, know of uh, John's work from his time at Partners Healthcare uh, and um, many of you probably know of him as, if I may say, kind of a rock star uh, CIO. Um, during his time there, and uh, has implemented a number of things in the partner system that have become standard throughout uh, many other hospitals. Um, in uh, one of the things that I like to think about is the is the work that uh, John Glasser did with Jeff Cooper uh, to think about the future of the relationship between biomedical engineering and information technology and how that synergy was going to play out to enable uh, things that uh, were not yet possible in healthcare. And so, and that certainly affected me in a very direct way. So a few other things about Dr. Glasser's background. He's a founding chairman of the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives, or CHIME. And uh, he spent a year in Washington as a senior advisor to the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology where he worked uh, on meaningful use related policy and implementation strategies uh, which are playing out now across the United States. Uh, he's recipient of numerous, numerous awards and, uh, and uh, numerous, has, has numerous publications in his name and I'm not going to embarrass him with a long list of the achievements but I could assure you that uh, there are a few people more qualified in the world to speak about the topic that he's going to speak about today. So John, please come up here and uh, let's welcome him. Uh, thank you, Julian, and I'm sure there's something that will advance slides uh, up here. Um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here and I appreciate uh, Julian's comments. Uh, and uh, rather flattering. As I was mentioning to a couple of folks before then, there's a particular title uh, that I have received that I'm, uh, it doesn't often come up in these introductions, uh, and that goes back to many, many years ago when I first started working. I was a consultant at Arthur D. Little and was, uh, went to a Marriott to fill out the Marriott Frequent Stayer application. And I got a letter from Marriott the following week to John P. Glasser, Puba, comma, Grant, Arthur D. Little. Uh, I had filled out Grand Puba is my title, and as far as the Marriott is concerned, that still is my title. Uh, I go forward here. Now, it was striking to me that somebody got it through the edits, uh, because Grand Puba is probably not in the allowable set of entries uh, for these kinds of systems. Some programmer decided that it wasn't Grand Puba, it was Puba, comma, Grand, was the right way to phrase it. And that the marketing people who I'm sure weekly look at the volume of stayers at the Marriott and said last week we had 1,400 CEOs, 1,200 CFOs, and one grand puba uh, signaling a new market. So anyway, I thought I would add that to the list of things that I've done. Um, what I'm going to do in a uh, reasonably uh, brief period of time, and I hope it's interesting and informative, uh, is talk about this. Now, one of the things you will notice is that in the um, material describing this talk, the actual title's the other way around, uh, the impact of information technology on healthcare, and I switched it. 
and I switched it because as we will see, I hope, in the next several minutes, uh, we are going to go through one of the most extraordinary decades, transformative decades of healthcare in the, this country, the U.S., but also think globally that we have ever seen. In fact, I think you have to go back in the U.S. into the 60s and the advent of Medicare and Medicaid to see something as potent as what we we're about to go through. The result of that, and it's very uncertain how this will play out or the final or mature form of this, will shape information technology in very significant ways and, the, and shape it in the way that we apply it, uh, shape it in where the investments are made, uh, shape it in the areas where you all uh, invest your intellect, your efforts, etc. If we look at this particular slide, a little bit of background, and this may be old news to you, is there is a continued concern about the costs of care. And these are two example graphs that illustrate both the uh, total amount being spent uh, in the U.S., and that's divided by per capita, and also a percent of G G GDP. So in addition to costs, if we can go to the next slide, um, the quality is not exactly something to crow about, uh, so to speak. So here in both the diabetes and hypertensions and the, um, maybe a victim of software counterfeiting. <laughs> that is cool, I've never seen that before on slides like this. But anyway, um, we'll presume that won't come back up again. Um, if you look at these graphs, these are for both diabetes and hypertensions. The, um, the numbers that you see there are essentially borderline being well managed. Um, and the point is, is that by and large, there's a whole bunch of folks with diabetes and hypertension in this country who are not well managed. Uh, and in fact, it gets worse uh, as they become poor. So we have costs that are too high and growing and quality that is uneven and for which there are disparities across uh, racial and ethnic uh, and geographic boundaries. Uh, and the next slide. In addition to that, here's a set of data that was gathered by some colleagues at Partners Healthcare over the period of my forever time there. Uh, and you'll see as we go through this a number of sets of data from Partners Healthcare because of the extraordinary amount of research and innovation that went on there. Thank you very much. Um, and also shape thinking. And what these data are about is looking at processes of outpatient care. And what they point to is some stuff that's terribly broken. Um, so if you take the second one, you know, if you're a woman with a marginally abnormal mammogram or pap smear, uh, it's clear what to do, and that is to follow up with a repeat exam within six months uh, and to see whether the situation is okay or not okay, et cetera. And you can see 36% of the time there was failure to follow up, you know, or insufficient follow up. The result being is that uh, by the time it was figured out that there was a failure to follow up on the abnormal result, the woman had stage three, stage four cervical or breast cancer, and it is a broken process. Processes, uh, despite the fact that there are terrific physicians, terrific nurses, and terrific healthcare professionals. So, I realize this is not exactly a pretty picture of healthcare in the US. Now, you could have been in this kind of setting about 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and seen similar slides. You know, and those of us who have been around these things have seen similar slides for quite some time. What I think is different now is that the mood of a decade ago has gone from anxiety to a mood today of alarm about this stuff. And there's a, my view, a fundamental reason why there is alarm, and that is the economic meltdown of 2008, which ballooned the federal deficit, put the states in a very precarious position, put businesses in a very worrisome position, uh, and also meant that all of us, even though we're unemployed, our 401k is less than it used to be, and our housing value may be below what we had thought. So all of a sudden, the, the backdrop of economic anxiety and concern has elevated this to the point where we're likely to see material change uh, in ways that we have not before. And if you look at this, and this is from Stuart Altman, who is an economist at Brandeis uh, nearby, you could probably characterize a lot of what has been done over the last couple of decades with that list of interventions on the left side of it. And, you know, things such as encouraging preventive care, uh, or having us as, as individuals pay more co-pays and deductibles, so we're more sensitive to the costs. Um, making you know, insurance transactions more ele or electronic rather than manual. And if you look at those things that have been sort of the core of a lot of what has been done over the last decades, to be frank about it, they haven't succeeded. Uh, they've had real modest impact. And so what is happening here is a shift to the right-hand column, which will be there are much more significant efforts to really ratchet down on the costs uh, and improve the quality. And you may or may not be familiar with some of these things, but I'll give you an example of the bullet on the top, bundled payment. 
So you would get a single payment for treatment of someone with a hip replacement, all the care that precedes the surgery, the surgery itself, and the rehab care following. You get a chunk of money. That's it. Uh, if you are more efficient, you keep the money. Uh, if you blow it and spend more, you lose money on this thing. And, and along with just make sure that you don't uh, shortchange the patient, you have to submit quality scores that show that you, in fact, delivered high quality care. And so movement to payment mechanisms like this. So one thread of here is very significant change in how people will be paid to deliver care. The second thread is, frankly, restructuring of the healthcare system as a byproduct of this. If you look at the U.S., there are approximately 5,000 hospitals out there. 60% are 100 beds or smaller. They're tiny. Uh, if you look at the physicians, the vast majority in the U.S. practice in physician groups of four or fewer. It's tiny, too. And it's hard to improve care when you're that fragmented and don't have the resources at each of these individual places. And so there'll be efforts to consolidate. Now, some might be large health systems like Partners Healthcare or Johns Hopkins, for example, but others might be contractual relationships between providers who say, we will agree to collaborate uh, to improve care. So two fundamental changes, changes in payment and the reduction in the fragmentation of this industry. A way to characterize this, and then we'll get into some of the IT impacts, is we are entering into an era of accountability. Now, to be crude about it, and you know, not quite accurate, if you were a physician or a hospital, by and large, for most of the last 20 years, you got paid just for doing something. You didn't have to do it well, you just got paid for doing it. Uh, so I got paid for the visit, got paid for the surgery, et cetera. What is happening here is that you are now accountable for the quality of the care and for the safety of the care and the efficiency of the care, and we will economically reward or punish you uh, to the degree that you do a, a poor job. So if you do surgery on the wrong site, uh, there's never events, or patients are readmitted because you didn't do a good job the first time, you will be economically punished. Uh, if you order an unnecessary radiology procedure, you will be punished. Uh, if you order a brand uh, drug when you could have ordered a generic, you will be economically punished. And if you do the flip side of those things, you will be rewarded. In addition to that kind of uh, reward and or punishment for decisions made is that a lot of mechanisms will say, I'm gonna give you a finite amount of money to manage a person with diabetes over the course of the year, regardless of the care that they will receive. All of it is under one chunk of money. The net effect of this is three fundamental changes. One is, is that if you deliver care 10 years from now, you will receive less, period, than you do today relative to inflation. So one way to look at this is Medicare says the amount we're going to pay hospitals between now and the end of the decade will go up 12%. We expect that the hospital's cost, its labor cost, power cost, et cetera, will go up 26%. So one year at a time, you fall behind relative to inflation and the pressure to become more efficient ensues. The second is that in a way, you used to be able to submit a claim for 100 bucks and you got paid 100 bucks. Now you'll submit a claim for 100 bucks, you'll get paid 90. And you get the remaining 10 if you presume or prove that you delivered high quality and efficient care. You're at greater risk. And the last point here is more holistic. And that is back to the total hip. One payment for all that happens uh, in the course of, of taking care of someone who needs a hip replace. Those of you who are students of Clayton Christensen and this notion of disruptive innovations and how a disruptor can turn an industry upside down or participants in it upside down, there is no greater disruptor in the provision of care than the payment system. And I frankly think you could solve cancer, frankly, tomorrow and be less disruptive than a radical change in the payment system, which is what we are about to go through. So this has lots of consequences. Obviously, one is to providers. Uh, the second, a, an explosion of information about cost and quality. How well do you do? So people can shop, whether you individually shop or people who purchase your care like your employer do this. Uh, there will be a lot of comparative effectiveness of research. Uh, so if I, and this is a challenge for Siemens, so Siemens comes out with a new moda, you know, imaging modality and they'd like providers to buy it, increasingly the provider will be, I'm under fixed payment and being rewarded for cost and uh, quality, et cetera. How will this modality improve my ability to demonstrate quality scores and be more efficient? That's hard. Uh, that's a hard thing to do and there'll be greater pressure on proving uh, that interventions actually elevate quality and reduce cost. And and then a creation of a wide variety of these accountable organizations who will come together and say, I will take this payment and I will be responsible for the care that is delivered. As we go through this decade, and it's frankly not something that started yesterday, it's been actually going on for uh, since you know, the late 1900s. 
is there will be a series of federal actions, U.S. federal government, that will shape this landscape. The U.S. government in, the, in this country is the gorilla uh, in healthcare. It accounts for about 40% of most hospitals' revenue and physician practice revenue. And so there is a series of laws and regulations that will be playing out between now and 2016 and beyond that will shape this healthcare system. Some of which have been put in place, like meaningful use. Some are kind of in place, at least there's a proposal, such as the shared savings program, and some that have yet to be written. The point being is that it's unclear uh, how this will evolve uh, in many ways. So it's not, we don't have this mature roadmap that says, here's where we'll be three years, here's where we'll be for six years. The other thing that's unclear is, will this all work? I mean, at the end of the day, will care quality really be better? Uh, and will care quality uh, costs really be lower? So we're entering into a decade of profound changes for which there is great uncertainty. Great uncertainty about the form of it, great uncertainty about the effectiveness of it, uh, and at the end of the day, whether we will decide that it's all been worth it. Now, to put this and to start dropping into the IT lens and uh, set up conclusions here, if you are a provider, and you could be a hospital or a large physician practice, you say, well, I appreciate the fuzziness surrounding the rules and the uncertainty, but nonetheless, it's not as if there's no knowledge about what is necessary here. You can make certain statements about what you will have to do. Uh, maybe you haven't been doing them now, but maybe you have to do them to a greater degree. It's to know who am I accountable for uh, in the patients here. So if I'm a cardiologist, and a patient is referred to me, uh, am I accountable for all of her care or part of her care? What is my accountability role relative to this consultation? Many primary care providers have patients assigned to them who they've never seen. Uh, they don't visit, and you know these could be young men who believe they're immoral, whatever it is, uh, or middle-aged men who believe they're immoral and never see a physician. So how much, and to what degree am I accountable for them if they actually don't come in? So there is a challenge of who am I accountable for of identifying that. And if you go down the left-hand side, regardless of the payment system, you're just going to get less. So efficiency efforts, uh, becoming more efficient, becoming more effective, higher quality, are, are material regardless of how the payment system changes, et cetera. There is the sort of become more integrated with care partners. I might decide that I will approach Blue Cross Blue Shield or Tufts or the federal government and say, I will assume accountability for the management of these patients, these 10,000 patients. And I'm going to deliver care that requires a relationship with you as a cardiology group, you as an oncology group, and you as an endocrinology group. I'm going to establish relationships with you, even though we're all legally separate, that collectively we will provide this care uh, and do a good job of it. So I have to become integrated with them, and I have to prepare and put together a continuum of care such that I can manage the needs of this entire population here, et cetera. In addition to that, last but not least, is I have to manage risk. So if I'm going to assume responsibility for 10,000 patients, I need to know, or would like to know, which of these patients are at risk of seek needing health care in the year ahead. Because I'm going to put special attention on them. I'm going to make sure that they you know, don't uh, fall apart, wind up in the hospital. So I need to know who are the fragile, who are the ones who are likely to be sick so I can take care of them. In the years ahead, and this may be part of Craig Vendor's talk, <coughs> increasingly your risk profile will be based on a genetic understanding of your makeup. So to the degree you're at high risk because of a genome that you possess or a proteome that you possess. When you take this and you turn to the providers of the world, see, this is what you need to do. If you are, and again, despite uncertainty, these will be the IT foundations upon which you will thrive, uh, or at least have a chance of thriving in this. The first is an electronic health record that spans a continuum, is in the inpatient, the outpatient, the emergency department, and what we call non-acute care, which is, covers a huge range. You have to be able to track a patient's care, document a patient's care, and share data about patients across this continuum. The second, you have to be able to do revenue cycle. This is the patient accounting, the billing systems, the registration and scheduling systems. Because you are going to get, for example, one payment for total HIP, and that will cover activity that happened in the hospital, happened in the physician offices, happened in the rehab of places, et cetera. And you need to distribute those funds to their billing systems. Uh, so one needs a consistent revenue cycle. The third is intelligence on the part of the machine to help you make these processes work better. And I'll show you an example in a second, but let's go, but we'll go back to that one about failure to follow up when this is some data partners, healthcare. If, why is it that there's a failure to follow up on abnormal result? What happens? And the average primary care doc sees 150 test results a day, which in a paper-based setting, surprise, 
things get lost. And surprise, they get tired and overlook certain things. The computer is very good at tracking electronically uh, whether or not a result is abnormal. It's very good at determining that. Number's too high, a phrase is in there. It's very good at saying, I'm gonna go to sleep for five and a half months and I'm gonna wake up. And once I wake up, I'm looking for the repeat exam, the repeat of visit, and if I don't find it, I'm gonna page Julian Goldman until he surrenders. Uh, all of our pages are sent to Julian Goldman and does this. So the computer has a workflow engine, a process underneath that manages this process called follow up on abnormal results. It could manage a process called transition of care, et cetera. So processes are machine technologies that allow processes to become smarter, less error prone, more efficient. Business intelligence, knowing where am I in my quality scores and to what degree am I making or losing money become important. Because care is now coordinated across multiple provider organizations, I need to share clinical data. I need to know if I'm referring someone to a cardiologist that they're aware of the tests that have been done, the allergies and the clinical question that I have. We need to engage patients in a more effective way. And then last but not least, is these technologies require ongoing help in improving workflow and making changes, et cetera. So this foundation is what will happen. And what's interesting is if you go through the potential ramifications of this payment reform, all of this is touched and all of this is changed. Now, when you step back and there's a series, I'm gonna uh, shift a little bit of gear here. If you look at all this, you say, if I had to sort of look at a logic train here, there is a need to increase accountability for care. And that's leading to significant changes in the uh, uh, reimbursement approaches and the structure, which impacts a broad array of technology. And if you step back and say, what is it that I really have to do in the next year? We have to do these four areas. And I'm gonna go through them. And part of the reason I'm gonna go through them is that there are things we do not understand how to do well yet. And realizing that a number of you are involved in academic pursuits and a number of you are involved in research development, to the degree you can solve these questions, we would be thrilled. Uh, and frankly, the healthcare sector would, in the US and overseas would be uh, thrilled. The first is care processes. And these are processes by which we uh, you know, track chronic disease or move someone from the hospital to the outpatient setting, uh, or as mentioned before, uh, follow up on abnormal results. There are a couple things that have to be done to improve processes. One is to what degree do current applications have to change? In other words, we've been using electronic health records for 40 years. So one of the cautions is not to presume that the electronic health record used 10 years ago is the right one to be used in the, in the next several years. Because if you make that assumption, you assume that the activities you were engaged in last year are going to be the activities you will be engaged in in a couple of years. And you can look behind the electronic health record and say, that's not strictly true. If you look at what most EHRs do today, they support what I call the serial treatment of patients. Nine o'clock, Mrs. Smith. Nine fifteen, Mr. Jones. Nine thirty, Mr. Rabinowitz. Here they come, one, you know, one after another, and away we go. And the job of the EHR is to help document, write prescriptions, and to do that quickly and efficiently, and et cetera. Just as one by each serial treatment of patients. That will still go on, but what is being added is you will also now be responsible for managing a population. And not just the serial treatment of an individual, of a sequence of them, but managing 5,000 or 10,000. In addition to that, you will also be responsible for coordinating care across many venues and settings in a way that you didn't do before. You might refer someone, uh, but you may or may not actually follow to see whether you actually got a consult note back or whether the lab test came back. You just assume that it did and someone would alert you if something were abnormal. So what it does is that certain core capabilities remain the same. Some that have been present, but maybe not all that well developed, will become more important, like tracking people across time or managing populations. But others will be relatively new. What we actually don't know how to do yet as an industry is if we have the coordination of care for a patient spread across five organizations, how do we collaborate across five organizations? I mean, what exactly does that look like? Is that a Facebook clone or equivalent, or how does that actually work? In addition to that, here's the exchange of data between participants. Now this is a classic diagram of, you see the organizations on the left going through the cloud, all architecture diagrams have to have a cloud, so there's a cloud in here, um, and they're moving clinical data, results, operative notes, back and forth. 
And it's easy to draw pictures like this, even though it's hard to implement them. If you look at the average primary care doc, how many people do, how many other providers do they interact with in the course of a year? Approximately 200. And so trying to put this in place across one to 200 and each of those to 200 is a complicated undertaking. Similarly, the applications that sit at top uh, that help you manage care across the setting are unclear and not well formed. In addition to this, it may very well be that the exchange of clinical data is actually one of the least important things to do. What's more important is events. In other words, I need to know, if I'm accountable, if you, and I referred you to a cardiologist, did you fail to show up? I need to know that. If you were seen in the emergency department, I need to know that. If you failed to pick up your drugs, I need to know that. So actually, what may be more important to me than clinical data is deviations in care from what I thought was going to happen. And that cause it can get me on the phone and call and see whether you need a ride to a cardiologist or something along those lines. In addition to this, one of the things that we assume is that giving you more data is helpful as a physician. That you know, what we ought to do is give you 200 progress notes rather than five, and 10,000 lab results rather than 100. We're going to overwhelm you, uh, and are probably overwhelming you already with data. And so one of the areas to do, and we're still figuring out how to do this, is can the computer condense and say, listen, I see a lot of data about Mrs. Smith, but at the end of the day, I see these five problems. Uh, and I think these are the critical results that you need to track if you're going to track and manage somebody with low uh, hypothyroidism. And by the way, I'm also making a judgment that this patient is undertreated. You can see that on the second line. And I'm going to suggest that you do something. And so using the intelligence of the machine to support the process of retrieving information and focusing on the condition of the patient and what should be done uh, next. And I'll give you an example of what this might look like under workflow here. And this is a woman who had a stroke uh, and 45 minutes later is in the ED. Uh, the uh, uh, nurse indicates to the computer that this is a stroke patient has arrived and a message is sent to the physician indicating that. The physician verifies the sort of confirmation of stroke and the computer instantly presents the orders that ought to be placed. Doesn't require you to go get them, just presents them. These are the orders that you ought to put in place given the fact that we have a stroke patient and you obviously can edit this. Now once launched, the machine is expecting the CT to be done, the CAT scan to be done within a defined period of time because the organization says that ought to happen within 20 minutes or 15 minutes, et cetera. And the computer detects that it has not happened within the time interval and so it generates an alert. It pages somebody or it shows up on a screen so this task sequence is taking too long and I now need to inform you that we need to get on the stick here. The point being, we'll just run out the rest of this thing, is that there is intelligence that is watching a process and making sure that the sequence occurs as it should in the right sequence, no omissions, commissions, and that the time interval between them is what it ought to be here. And last but not least, before we get into the questions here, this is some work that was done by colleagues Blackford Middleton and others at Partners Healthcare using some smart form. And one of the things that you see is the use of decision support in the EHR at times is terrifically successful. And you can see the row called up-to-date blood pressure result and a terrific increase in just getting a current blood pressure on the patient. Other times you can see change in diabetic therapy, the second row from the bottom, not much progress at all. Point being is that at times we introduce these improvements to processes and they'll work. I mean, they don't make the changes or the magnitude of changes, whether through decision support or other things that we had anticipated that they would. It is not automatic. So, here are the questions that we are interested in. Is when you look at healthcare, it is a combination of two classes of processes. One is very factory like, you know, you, you, know, you run the lab very factory like in a lot of ways. So you can design systems that make those processes more efficient because the sequence is known, the steps are known, et cetera. The other set of uh, pr uh, processes are much more experimental, like house, watching a house on TV. We don't know what's wrong. We're gonna do this, we're gonna try that. It's very experimental, high research. In a healthcare setting, both go on all the time. And both have very different system designs uh, the, to support. And they go on all the time in a life of a particular doctor and in the life of a particular patient. So designing systems that support routine activities that need to go on all the time, be very efficient, is different from those that are to support you in making a decision about what to do next. And designing them so they support both is hard. The second is we are still, as most provider organizations, actually terrible at process change. 
terrible at changing organizations to, to be different in the way that they do their work, despite having done this for quite some time. And so there is a series of things that are still to be done to help organizations be more effective. And it's not just the mass generals of the world, it is the small community critical access hospital, which does not have the talent or the skills to do these things. We can talk about processes that span organizations, that coordinate care between patients and physicians who are spread across you know, a good part of Boston and separate. But we actually don't know how to design or manage processes like that. I actually haven't learned a lot in healthcare from manufacturing or other elements of the supply chain where there are processes that span organizational boundaries. And then the last point here is when I, at one point in my tenure at Partners, we said, how many instances of medical knowledge are there in our systems? He said, well, what's an instance of medical knowledge? Uh, an order set is, a decision support rule is, a workflow, all are instances of medical knowledge. And the answer is at the time, there were about 36,000. And that number is presumably a lot larger than it was when this was done about eight years ago. How do you manage a base of tens of thousands of rules and pieces of logic within these things such that they're consistent, uh, current, and leading to the type of gain? So there's a series of stuff to be done on processes, which and questions are answers to the degree that we, be, we can will be needed in the years ahead to help address this. In the analytics, um, this is an example of fusion of clinical data and revenue cycle data. If you look at this, this is a dashboard of how well am I doing in managing a population of diabetics. And you can't read the tiny little print, but in that pie chart, uh, and I'm colorblind, so I'm not really sure what color it is, but it's the big gray or pink or whatever it is piece that's over there. That is the percent of patients in this population who have not had a hemoglobin A1C taken at all in the last year. I mean, so we're not only bad, we're just not managing them at all because there's no recent test. Now that's bad care. In addition to that, in the years ahead, there will be instant revenue loss. For every day that that goes on, you're going to lose money. And so there will be in the analytics, the fusion of this type of data and the helping people understand the clinical along with financial consequences of decisions or uh, failure to do very well. The second thing here is that in a lot of cases in analytics today in healthcare, we tolerate a certain amount of crap uh, that's in the data. Uh, and that will be less and less tolerable. So for example, one of the quality measures to report is the degree to which you provided smoking cessation counseling to those who are smokers. Um, and yet if you looked in the problem list, at times you find there's no record of the person being a smoker even when they are. Remember, you know, one study is looking at the problem list in some of the systems at partners and finding that the problem list had 60% of all the problems that were in there and the rest were in the node or somewhere else. In addition to the problem list were entries that were not problems at all, like ask her about her daughter next time you see her. Uh, you know, maybe the kid was an issue, but it was not a clinical problem in that sense. So because it is important because of care quality, but also reimbursement, that numerators and denominators be sound uh, and as comprehensive as it can be. In this case, the computer is coming and saying to you, the doctor, I don't see smoking status in the problem list, but I have detected in the note evidence that this person is a smoker. Would you like to add it to the problem list? So the machine is looking for consistency of data, pointing out an entry where there, sh there isn't one. And in other cases, an example we use is the problem list had heart attack in there, but there was no clinical data at all that indicated a heart attack ever occurred. Um, and so are you sure that heart attack occurred? So we will see intelligence in the machine directed to improving the quality of the data. Another example, and mentioned this before, is uh, prediction. And so in this example here, the machine is saying you have three patients with stroke. Uh, patient number two is at very high risk of a readmission being very expensive and being quite fragile. Um, and I'm going to suggest that you surround that patient with particular clinical uh, help and support because they're very fragile. Patient number three, low risk. I mean, don't ignore them, but low risk. So the machine helping one figure out where to focus clinical resources because of high risk uh, patients either now or likely to be. Another example, this is where data was used to pick up the Vioxx signal and data from the Brigham and Mass General Emergency Department. So you can see the admissions to those two emergency departments in which the admit diagnosis was myocardial infarction, heart attack, confirmed heart attack. And you can see the dotted line is the baseline rate and all of a sudden it jumps. The, admission, the sort of diagnosis rate jumps in 2001 and tails back back to baseline in 2005. The arrows are the beginning of Vioxx prescription writing within the partner's healthcare system, and the arrow on the right is the withdrawal from the market. 
And so using the data to pick up signals of post-market surveillance or problems uh, with a drug or other device here, et cetera. Another thing, and this is the last slide here on this particular section, is that in Siemens, we have people who say, listen, we're gonna be increasingly difficult to target the right treatment. How many different forms of leukemia and lymphoma are there today? The answer is 62. Uh, and that is a result of scientific discovery about the nature of different forms of leukemia and lymphoma. Increasingly, it is hard to figure out the right treatment given that kind of diversity. And so the folks are taking this uh, stunning array of data, which is the second column under our observations. So this is imaging data, proteomic, genomic data, along with electronic health record data, combining it to see whether or not we can be better at targeting the therapy that ought to work for particular forms of cancer. And again, looking for RLC curves that are spectacular in doing this, but looking at different types of data to improve uh, treatments. So there's a variety of things still to be understood is how do we compensate for quality data problems? It will always be crappy uh, because there's always a challenge for those who provide care to really take the time to record all that they need to have or because of inconsistencies. One of the striking things to be done is we looked at some data to what degree will the progress note describe obesity and finding that if you are from a county with a high rate of obesity, obesity is, is actually not recorded all that often. There's an assumption that you are because there you go. And the degree to which obesity is recorded is actually correlated with how heavy the doctor is. Uh, so you have biases and screwiness. Uh, you're not fat, you look just like me, we're both terrific uh, and all this stuff. So there's ways to compensate uh, because of biases and a variety of other things and a lot to be learned. Um, can you in effect do away with portions of the clinical trial uh, by doing in silico monitoring of things to determine effectiveness, sort of compare one drug versus another, go back in time, roll forward, uh, see whether or not there's a difference there or differences in effectiveness, uh, et cetera. And then we're still learning about the last one about how to combine different data, image data, proteomic data, genomic data, EHR data, claims data, personal health record data uh, to improve care. Closing in on here is the other area of, is engaging patients. Now this is some examples from the Center for Connected Health at Parkers, and you can see that you know using some self-monitoring that those who are I or interventions did a better job of reducing blood pressures than those who were in the controls. Nice progress that went on here. And this other example is monitoring patients with congestive heart failure at home uh, is that the hospitalization rate drops as a result of just being quicker uh, to pick up signals and challenges, uh, et cetera. And then we also see this advent, and this is patients like me, which is one of the most uh, impressive of these, is communities where people with uh, diseases get on together and share. And particularly where the disease is a daily reality. I mean, you don't actually find people sharing about blood pressure. Uh, you do find people sharing about neurological disorders because there's a daily reality. Cancer's got a daily reality. Fertility issues have a daily reality. Having a spouse with dementia is a daily reality. And as we look at this, there's a bunch of questions. We, I, we actually don't know how to engage certain types of patients. So if, and maybe we never will. So if you're 82 years old with limited cognitive abilities, you don't speak English and you got a boatload of chronic disease issues, it may be that IT is the wrong answer uh, for you, et cetera. So we are not quite sure how to engage people using the technology or even using them in healthcare in general. We're not sure yet about how best to leverage these virtual communities uh, to really improve care. And we still, when you type in diabetes into the search engine, you get presented with a bewildering array of data. So helping you find answers to you, your questions still remains very, very difficult, uh, et cetera. And then the last one, and I have to be mindful of time, is to this point, the sort of basic approach is that we're going to have profound changes in the healthcare system in the U.S. and will cascade into the, uh, to Europe and other markets uh, over the course of the years. It will be driven by the need to make you know, true uh, concern about quality and cost and have fundamental changes uh, to the reimbursement and the structure of the system. It will require that we become a lot better at processes, require we get a lot better at data, and require that we get a lot better at engaging patients. Now to this point, it's been a sort of technology, a context that shapes technology, and this is the one technology slide here. I've been around for a while. And I have seen what I think are five computer or IT revolutions. One was the mainframe, the second was the mini computer, the third was the network personal computer, the fourth was the internet, and now we're in the fifth. Uh, and I'm gonna describe the fifth in just a second. And these are revolutions that occur because of a confluence of things happen, and it's kind of an ecosystem of changes. So if you look at the PC revolution, why did that become such a revolution? 
Well, it partly had to do with microprocessor exam, uh, advances, partly to do with storage advances, but it also had to do with IBM's decision about DOS, to essentially give it away, you know, make it public. And it happened to do with the advent of the spreadsheet, which turned it into something truly useful. And it happened to take advantage of a parallel advance in networking technologies. Many things had to come together to create that revolution. The narrow end era now is that um, there is essentially a processor on everything. Uh, virtually, I'll bet you there's no one in here, I mean, I'm not sure I bet much, who does not have a, a machine, a network personal computer in the form of a mobile device on them right now. Virtually everybody does, and the elevators, and the trains, and your car, and all kinds of stuff. There are processors on them, and they're networked uh, in a way that is stunning. Um, and in addition, we're getting much better at sensors in sort of to pick things up. And whether they're temperature or one of the new ways to pick up uh, whether or not your blood sugar levels are amiss is whether uh, certain uh, contact lenses change color because of chemical sensors that are going on here. These collection of sensors and this broad array of processing, very powerful machines that are networked together, is leading to a stunning amount of data and very novel ways of analyzing it. And so one of the things that we can begin to do, some of which we've mentioned, is essentially to do uh, uh, comparative effectiveness. Is this treatment better than others within the data? We can also orchestrate complex processes. You can manage the flow of traffic through a city. You can manage a power grid. Uh, you can manage someone's sort of choices, uh, books or CDs on the internet. So we are in this era, and what's unclear is about how best to leverage this era in healthcare because of this nearly ubiquitous network computing generating stunning amounts of data in which people are going to supply very sophisticated analytics to see patterns uh, and also to expedite a number of things that right now take us a great deal of time to discover. So examples here. These are some things that still need to be understood, and I know a couple of colleagues, a bunch of colleagues and partners and elsewhere are looking at these kinds of things. Um, and in addition to all this kind of stuff, it is the security of this apparatus. So one caution as we get carried away by all of this interoperability and connection, et cetera, is the fundamental basis of care delivery is trust between a patient and the person delivering their care. That, that dialogue will be kept confidential uh, between them and uh, be used only for their benefit and not for their harm. To the degree that that trust is eroded if they're afraid to say things because of, then we will undermine healthcare in a way that is faster and more debilitating and devastating than perhaps anything that we might do here. And I don't mean to overplay the drama there, but nonetheless, the security issue is a terribly important one. So that's it. Uh, I'm going to stop now, and I apologize for first being incoherent, uh, second for talking very fast. Uh, I'm mindful of other things that await you uh, in this afternoon. And let me see if there are any questions or comments about anything that I have said. And thank you. Microphones. There are. Ah, there, there you go. You have a roving mic. Great for questions. Please go ahead. Oh, you, uh, you don't have a question. You're looking for a. You're looking for a question. Okay. We have microphones that are looking for questions. Here we go up here in the front. Sir. Oh, thank you. John, you mentioned uh, beginning your talk that uh, you felt that um, diseases like cancer could be affected, I'm say cured, but certainly. Uh, more progress made relative to uh, improving uh, the likelihood of, um, of uh, surviving cancer by changes in our uh, payment system and uh, other aspects of our healthcare system. So could you talk a bit about how this type of reform or thinking can be applied to a specific disease like cancer that um, um, how would you imagine those changes be made that could fundamentally change how we uh, approach uh, that disease and uh, treatments and ultimately uh, success for survival. Yeah, I call there's a couple points. One is in the particular context, I actually think changes in reimbursement can change healthcare the way we do it more so than just solving cancer would. But I mean, that's to sort of put it in the magnitude. That being said, it's, I think it's a fair point. Um, increasingly, people will say, golly, cancer is going to, as people get older, there will be more cancer. Um, and so organizations and providers who are willing to say, I will take care of cancer for this population, and maybe it's all cancers, and maybe it's breast cancer, or this form of cancer, et cetera. Uh, and that those providers have figured out ways to be 
be more effective at both preventing it and or treating it once they occur than they and be able to show that, uh, then they'll do well. And so I think there is, if the mode is the payment is moving to, I'm going to give you a block of money for taking care of a population of patients with this particular set of disease, you got to show me quality, but if you're efficient, you win uh, on this kind of stuff then there will be a lot of innovative activity This is how do we become more efficient? How do we keep them around longer? How do we let them get back to work? How do we make the treatment less expensive, et cetera? Um, in some ways, it is, a, it is a tr exactly the right way to pay. So I'm gonna give you a fixed amount of money, you show me that you're good, you figure it out. Rather than me trying to tell you how to do this, you be the innovator within that. So I think you could play that at cancer, you could play that at heart disease, you could play that at mental health issues, you could play that at lower back pain, uh, and a variety of things in which um, you, you, I guess you sort of fix the game, you not fix the game, but you constrain the game and let people innovate within that. Now, specifically how that will happen, I'm not sure, but there are clear ways that it will occur. John, we both share the bias that organized systems are safer for patients yeah. than unorganized systems. And yet the data that you show from partners that 36% of women with breast abnormalities don't get followed, would make you wonder about that. Is it that much worse out in the community? Uh, and if it's not, then maybe the solution isn't organizing them. It's using technology for all of those doctors uh, to help guide them to the right decisions. Yeah, I think here's a couple things. One is that data was gathered by partners researchers but covered a broad uh, array of partners and non-partners facilities. But nonetheless, you know, I think the point is that there are partners facilities in that data. Um, and I, I think that it is, you know, an a, a indication that per se being a quote integrated system does not mean that there's integrated well oiled processes that occur. Um, there's obviously a fair amount of work that is still required to go off and get those. The thing that was striking to me is that data like that had not been routinely gathered before. People didn't know, you know, how bad some of these things were. They might know about utilization rates are too high or too low, but not how bad some of their processes were. What's not clear to me yet is if you say, well, I'm going to have a virtual organization, you know, essentially people who are different legally, uh, but who get together and some have this system, some have that system, and we're going to orchestrate these processes. So how well will that work? Uh, it's intriguing, and it's worth going after. Um, right now, we have very simplistic ideas. We're going to exchange data. You know, here comes the chemistry result. Here comes the consult report back. That is a step towards, but well short, uh, process coordination and orchestration, et cetera. So how we will get that is really unclear. And it's one of those areas that's gotta be solved uh, in a level because I don't think the answer is y'all gotta come together under a big umbrella that has a common parent and uses a common system that eases some of the challenge, but it can't be the only answer that goes on there. So long way saying, I think there's a lot that is not understood about how to, or not uh, understood about how to do that efficiently and effectively across virtual places. Uh, hi, uh, I wonder if Siemens provides like a smartphone application for any health problem, like it can be used worldwide, even if they don't have access to PC or internet. You know, we, um, we don't, I mean, we provide the ability for customers to put those kinds of applications on smartphones and, and, or other mobile devices uh, and run through the, uh, et cetera. And by and large, our customers are those who deliver care, and if they then want to turn and offer stuff to you as patient, uh, they will do that. Um, and so anyway, part of it is patient-directed where somebody else provides it, and some of which is where we have uh, the sort of ability to do that, but we don't have the applications that are per se helping you think through a chronic disease question or things along those lines. Um, what I don't really know yet is my gut is that the mobility per se, uh, while important, useful, and you got to get your stuff to run on the mobile devices, is less potent by a long shot than the utility of the data that is generated underneath. Um, and that will, the fact that we can all walk around and do stuff, that's cool. Uh, but there is something very, very powerful about the data underneath and the ability to look for stuff. So in a way, we, we do stuff on the mobility, but it doesn't have nearly as much attention as the analytics surrounding the data because there's more potency there. I need to let you all go off to your next appointed round. So anyway, one, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to shortchange you. Yes, wrap yes, up our um, Q&A. My question is that, uh, uh, do you think that accountable healthcare organization will thrive because it's a recently launched healthcare policy, uh, account accountable healthcare uh, organization, ACL? Yeah, make sure. Um, 
I think you, you have to separate it to the accountable care organization defined or being defined by Medicare from the general notion of being accountable for care and organizing to provide that. You know, there will be some federal, there will be lots and lots of definitions of organizations or arrangements that are going to be held accountable. Uh, some will be what the federal government says, but a lot of them won't be. And so, so I think one of the things we hear, the federal government will come out with a definition, and that's how we'll pay. But there are lots of ways that people will arrange themselves to be held accountable and to participate in the fund. So I'll make sure I got your answer to your question. I'm saying just uh, um, because because the healthcare policies is ever changing, and how do you explain or uh, industry can respond to the inconsistency of the healthcare system policy changes? I think well, I think it's going to be one of our issues is that it's we're going to muddle our way through the next decade with a variety of inconsistencies, conflicting ideas, things that we thought were really smart that turned out to be really stupid, uh, things we didn't think would be so smart turning out to be quite smart all along. Uh, you know, wild cards is, you know, how engaged will consumers really be? I don't really know. Uh, you know, so we've talked about it for forever and had modest uptick on that kind of stuff. So there will be a, this will be one of the, this will be one of the hard parts. There is profound change that is very idiosyncratic, inconsistent, experimental, and uh, fuzzy. So enjoy it, because uh, it's going to be, it, and I think the consequences is just one last comment, is uh, it, we, it needs to work, because if we get to the end of this decade and we've broken it, you know, made it worse, or haven't solved anything, we are in a lot of trouble, uh, you know, within the U.S. and broadly speaking here. So the, the stakes are quite high in this really complex, messy uh, process here. So anyway, all of you rest up and get to work, because we'll need you all collectively. Let's thank Dr. Glasser. Thank you. Yeah.